Near the height of the Cold War, a Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile launches Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. The satellite does little more than broadcast a radio beacon, but the world would never be the same. The space age has begun, and America appears to be losing. The nation suddenly seems vulnerable. The Soviet capability to launch a satellite into orbit suggests they have rockets powerful enough to launch nuclear weapons that could reach North America. America's oceans could no longer protect it from rockets that rained from the sky. The surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor during World War II pales in comparison to this new threat of a surprise nuclear attack. However, President Dwight Eisenhower does not see Sputnik as a cause for alarm. At a press conference scheduled five days after Sputnik's launch, he repeatedly insists the satellite is merely a scientific achievement and not a national security threat. As far as the satellite itself is concerned, that doesn't raise my apprehensions, not one iota. The mere fact that this thing orbits involves no due to discovery to science. They knew it could be done. At least they say so, and they have for a long time. So that's no new discovery. So it, in itself, it imposes no additional threat to the United States. Thank you. The Soviets hoist an even larger satellite into orbit a month later, weighing over a thousand pounds, and this time carrying a dog, Laika. Soviet propagandists use these satellite achievements to imply that the communist system is superior to that of the Western world. They were still trying to make communism attractive all over the world to third world countries. And uh, they were doing part of this by claiming that they had technical and research superiority to the United States. They had succeeded with Sputnik at a time when the United States was too often having our missiles blow up on the launch pad. It was seen as something that we had to catch up with immediately. American media and opposition politicians paint Eisenhower as old and out of touch, urging the development of expensive crash programs in space and defense. Seeking to reassure a fearful nation and to advocate for a moderate, practical course of space development, Eisenhower addresses the American public from the White House. My fellow citizens, my subject tonight is science in national security. Earth satellites in themselves have no direct present effect upon the nation's security. However, there is real military significance to these launchings. For example, the powerful propulsion equipment necessarily used. We frankly recognize that the Soviets are building up types of power that could, if we were attacked, damage us seriously. This is because no defensive system today can possibly be airtight in preventing all breakthroughs of planes and weapons. One of our greatest and most glaring deficiencies is the failure of, the unite, of us in this country to give high priority enough to scientific education and to the place of science in our national life. The peaceful contributions of science to healing, to enriching life, to freeing the spirit, these are the most important products of the conquest of nature's secrets. What the world needs today, even more than a giant leap into outer space, is a giant step toward peace. Never shall we cease to hope and work for the coming of the day when enduring peace will take these military burdens from the backs of men. And when the scientist can give his full attention, not to human destruction, but to human happiness and better. Eisenhower's newly formed Presidential Science Advisory Committee provides recommendations on how to best advance into space. The President announces that the U.S. will launch its first satellite, the Vanguard, in just one month. The satellite had been in development for years, but its launch is now moved up four months ahead of schedule. It is the first mass broadcast of a launch. Before the eyes of the world, it is a colossal failure. American prestige takes another dramatic blow. Eisenhower quickly approves the use of a more powerful Jupiter rocket that has been in development by the Army. A launch date of January 29, 1958 is announced for the next attempt at a satellite launch. Finally, four months after Sputnik, America succeeds in hoisting the Explorer 1 satellite into orbit. But there is much to be done to catch up to the Soviets in world opinion. 
Despite his reluctance to create another expensive government bureaucracy, Eisenhower signs into law the National Aeronautics and Space Act, creating NASA to coordinate American scientific activities in space. He also approves the National Defense Education Act, a landmark education bill that provides funding to strengthen American science and technology. Just days after NASA's creation, Project Mercury is announced. The objective? To send a man into space, orbit him around the Earth, and return him safely. They were looking at people with all kinds of backgrounds on what was gonna be the space program. When it came to Ike's attention, he felt that the military test pilots were the ones that had the right kind of background that was needed in the program. And they were doing it because they had a passion for flight and they believed in what they were doing. The objective to me was not just to go into space as a stunt. It was to go into space to learn new things. There were a lot of unknowns at that time. And there were all kinds of things that we were gonna to have to deal with to make a successful flight. Eisenhower saw this as something that was going to be important for the future and moved then to set us up in a advantageous organizational position with NASA to show that we certainly were not behind the Soviets in science and research and technology as they were claiming all over the world. On December 18, 1958, America launches an Atlas intercontinental ballistic missile into orbit. The missile carries the world's first communication satellite, known as Project SCORE. Two days later, it broadcasts a tape-recorded message from the president, the first human voice to emanate from space. By the end of Eisenhower's term in office, America is orbiting three times as many satellites as the Soviet program. American satellites achieved technological breakthroughs in reconnaissance, navigation, and meteorology. After a troublesome start, investments in science and education and Eisenhower's steady leadership would lead to a flurry of future achievements in space. Four months after Eisenhower leaves office, Alan Shepard succeeds as the first Mercury astronaut in suborbital flight. Eisenhower wanted our program to be open and to represent our feeling that the whole world could be doing these things together. John Glenn, in his Friendship 7 space capsule, prepares to be the first American to orbit the Earth. I had a lot of confidence that this was going to be a success, or I would not have gotten on it. I was not interested in any suicide mission. As I was going up, I could see the Earth receding, and so I was looking back across the whole sweep of the Gulf of Mexico. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Oh, that view is tremendous. Uh, Friendship 7, the shoot looks very good. Over. All these things that we associate with the space program came to be in a lot more coordinated fashion by Eisenhower's decision to form NASA. It's exploring space. It's going places that we've never been before. It's learning things that we never knew or maybe couldn't even imagine. And understanding how that fits into the overall future of the human race. President Eisenhower was laying a foundation for our space program. And we're still building on what we learned, taking that into the future. 